uh, distributed systems architecture and models so we have two comp uh, things here that we need to understand the architecture of distributed systems and also the models right now uh, architecture is a blueprint or how these particular systems are designed and to help us achieve the correct design of our distributed systems we need to have the different categories of models as we are going to see but first we are going to introduce maybe to understand uh, the general uh, organization and architecture of distributed systems right so we have the hardware component of these distributed systems and of course we also have the software component which maybe when we combine together will help us understand the overall architecture of a distributed system so i'm not going to go into details of what hardware and softwares are but we are just going to uh, understand what are the various hardwares and softwares that are essential when crafting up a particular architecture of a distributed system so our distributed systems are made uh, or they actually uh, have organization of multi processors yeah since we have distributed systems and the kind the nature of work that they perform uh, they need multiple processors so that's kind of uh, some kind of uh, sub characteristic of a distributed system they also have or operate under multiple uh, computers uh, we are going to look at also the network heterogeneity right so when we have the architecture of distributed system we can talk about multi computer networks and computers most importantly is combining the two approaches multiple computers running on multiple processors right so this brings in the idea of sharing memories yeah sharing uh, the different uh, components or objects uh, as you're going to say so this can be achieved through bus connection or switch connection as shown as, as, as shown so we have shared memory and private memory I think the concept is very clear here when you have multi processors are being maybe integrated within this multi uh, computer uh, approach this we have the two categories shared and private memory yeah so the concept is within the private memory as the name suggests every processor yeah has or can holistically use their memory without sharing right so they have two options as you can see there's a bus approach where they can uh, privately or connect the multiple processors but the idea is each and every processor shares the or don't share but actually has their own memory of course you have the switched option for the private memories as you can see now this is a concept whereby mod, uh, different computers or machine can always uh, kind of substitute or I uh, give a particular a processor an option to share this particular memory without really sh uh, sharing those particular memory when we talk about share memory or shared memory as you can see the bus approach all the computers or can uh, the processors can be able to uh, use the available memory and also you can see there's a kind of a star topology under the switched uh, network or switched option that allows the various processors to share that particular memory so when you talk about uh, this kind of architecture that is being uh, implemented uh, within the multiprocessor and multi-computer environment we talk about sharing of memory now this is a very important concept that is going to help us understand uh, how the communication happens when we are going to look at group communication and I think one of the vital components is this kind of sharing of memory in a particular uh, distributed system architecture also we need to understand that there are multiple uh, components that are actually brought together to operate as a single a unit yeah so we have multiple processors as you have seen yeah this 
aspect of bringing different hardwares and softwares yeah and bring them together to work together that is is what we refer to as heterogeneity yeah so there are two uh, terms here that we are going to look at heterogeneity and homogeneity heterogeneity is actually integrating different technologies uh, uh, integrating different technologies so that they work uh, together right so we can also have wireless connection within a particular distributed system various uh, what we refer to as ubiquitous kind of computing we also have high latency connections these are issues also that we need to check like latency we also have wide area uh, networks uh, sorry uh, I, I was actually uh, talking about node heterogeneity so we have mobile computers different categories of computers that work within a distributed system we also have high-end computers we have networks even users yeah you can form this aspect of heterogeneity because we can't really have distributed systems operating on their own so we need to have users uh, using this particular uh, systems remember we have categories of users that we're not going to actually list here but we have those who are naive users those who are expert users developers programmers and so on uh, the other wing is a network heterogeneity in a distributed system actually distributed systems are implemented on a network right so we can have this kind of implementation in different networks running different speeds like you have local area networks we have wireless connections we have wide area networks and so on so this concept of bringing on board different categories of networks so that we can have distributed system working is what we refer to as network heterogeneity and this also forms the other aspect of architecture that we need to understand away from the hardware we have software and we are just going to keenly look at the three categories of software yeah distributed operating system yeah that means a distributed system must have a distributed operating system we're going to see how then uh, how it works we also have network operating system yeah any given distributed system must actually uh, work under given a network and the operating system that's going to provide the essential services uh, is actually the network operating system so we have different categories of a network operating system which i believe you can identify uh the game changer in the distributed system is the middleware yeah middleware actually is this kind of application that brings some kind of abstraction layer or installation layer that ensures that uh, the different layers or uh, actually the different components within a distributed system i uh, really don't need to know what the other uh, component does so it kind of brings in the abstraction uh, component so in a nutshell we have different categories of operating systems yeah like the DOS that is a distributed operating system runs within the shared memory you uh, you remember I said that this sharing of memory will actually come up so we have tightly coupled OS that means these kind of computers run under shared uh, memory we talk about multiprocessors yeah so the fact here is we can have different computers running the same operating system running the, under the same hardware uh, features and so on that is what we refer to as homogeneous right so the main goal here is to manage i, I think the key uh, the key feature of any operating system is to manage and control how hardware uh, resources are functioning uh, the other operating system as i mentioned is a network operating uh, system this one operates under loosely coupled or what we refer to as a distributed memory right loosely coupled operating system actually operates based on uh, shared or i mean distributed memory now we talk about distributed memory we have the concept of heterogeneous so heterogeneous as you have seen this kind of network operating system can work under different hardwares or even networks so the main goal here is to ensure that local services and even uh, the kind of uh, requests uh, from the client computers are actually accorded of course we have the middleware as i've, I've mentioned it brings some kind of added layer 
right that ensures that the different hardware and softwares work uniformly without really uh, bothering to understand the kind of hardware or software that has been installed now what are some of the characteristics of DOS or distributed operating system yeah so one thing that we have seen with DOS is that it operates within the environment of homogeneity homogeneous where we can have different machines running on the same operating system and also uh, are actually implemented within the same hardware environment so that is the operating system should be in a position it should not really bother to know what other computers uh, is all about we have OS that operate under different computers that are the same I think I've already mentioned that and I think also transparency factor remember some of the characteristics of distributed system we talk about transparency and that part of the distributed system that brings about transparency is the distributed operating uh, system so it doesn't really uh, matter the concept is the same homogeneous kind of approach where we have different machines running the same operating system and actually are implemented uh, within the same hardware uh, characteristics of network operating system I've already mentioned yeah now here ideally computers work in isolation but the good thing is that we have the distributed application mechanism right so uh, we have different server, uh, services that are provided under different computers based on the network operating uh, systems right so here each computer has its own operating system with the network uh, facility I, I, th I think I'll spare the a lot of explanation just look at the normal organization how network uh, is implemented we have client and server computers or server computers actually running the op network operating system and how they are be able to do it to share resources yeah? so here computers tend to work independently providing different server uh, services uh, to the various clients so here network operating system i believe we understand how it works the other uh, application is the middleware i've already mentioned the abstraction component yeah so here it also provides some kind of uh, transparency yeah so that when other different hardwares or operating systems are opera are actually connected they don't really bother to understand what other or how the other kind of hardware operates like hardwares could be from different manufacturers operating systems also could be uh, different have Linux we could have uh, we could have um, Windows and so on so the main uh, purpose of the middleware is to ensure that all the applications that are running within these different uh, operating systems actually don't need to understand the kind of hardware or software that have been implemented and that's what we refer to as transparency or better still offering openness uh, to this kind of uh, connected uh, system so I think these three applications or rather operating systems uh, help us understand the kind of architecture that this particular distributed uh, systems operate or under or in so why should we have or what is the need of actually middleware because uh, as I mentioned this is a very vital application or operating system for that matter there was a desire yeah, there was a desire to actually ensure that various applications work seamlessly, right? So we had different network applications that were very hard to, to integrate or rather configure. So that is what motivated uh, maybe the programmers to come up with this kind of what? Uh, application, the middleware. So also different departments or organization uh, were running different operating systems such as network operating systems from Linux and so on. So they wanted a very, uh, an, uh, a single uniform uni interface that the other applications could actually understand. And I think the same concept is replicated. Yeah, We are going to look at distributed, uh, database distributed systems, how database distributed systems are implemented. So also it helps combine different uh, databases running under different so, uh, database management systems. 
you could have oracle mysql right so it also help bring or combine all these to provide a single view of operation also transactions in different uh, databases right anything that actually is isolated this middleware tends to bring and ensure that they talk together so we can give go ahead and give as many uh, examples why we need a middleware as possible all right now with that understanding uh, the architecture of a distributed system actually is composed with different components as you have already seen right now different components comprise of different objects yeah and these objects within different components in a given distributed system needs to talk to each other now that particular point where a particular component needs to talk to a particular component by sending or actually invoking an object is what we refer to as interfaces within a distributed a system so a given example is uh, we can say a client computer are uh, talking to a server computer yeah so it could be it could, it could happen that a client computer is requesting for a particular uh, for a particular service yeah so we should have some kind of uh, option to provide that particular service and that is what we refer to as service interface so the major known interfaces are the remote interface we are going to see how the invocation happens yeah like having remote procedural call so we need to have an interface where the two uh, server and actually the client also allows the object uh, call to happen of course we have the object interfaces yeah we can't really uh, talk about object oriented kind of uh, programming without understanding how the programmer can program the different parts of the distributed system so we have the object interfaces or what we or what we normally refer to as the application yeah our programming interfaces that allows some set of methods to be called arguments and so on so if you are a good programmer and you want to maybe uh, ensure that you have the right interface to interrogate the distributed system then we need to have the object interfaces so they're very very crucial when you talk about the architecture uh, of the uh, of this particular uh, distributed system now to wrap up the entire architecture we have two major uh i can talk about the two major system architectures that is the client server i think i've already mentioned about that and since i said that we need to have some kind of understanding of how a network operates or how we uh, bring on board the different uh, clients and server computers in a network if you understand that concept then that's how the distributed system architecture uh, looks like we can give examples yeah we have different servers file server print server <laughs> web server all of them communicate in a similar manner it's only that the resources that is request requested is a bit uh, different but we are going to look at maybe other aspects of this kind of architecture we're going to break them down to understand them uh, in uh, in detail right we talk about the system uh, models yeah so you're going to look at this kind of system architectures with respect to the specific part of the uh, architecture so we are going to look at the physical model talk about the fundamental models and so on so we can give a, uh, examples but what we need to understand in this kind of architecture is that we have one process actually are requesting for some kind of service which is actually uh, being uh, that can be provided by a given server as you know server is a dedicated computer within a network so it goes round and round bit print server bit uh, a bit uh, web server bit web server a uh, bit any kind of server and client machine uh, we can always have that kind of arrangement right uh, sorry i was still looking for something now here is a diagram uh here's a diagram that shows how this kind of uh two components or processes uh actually work 
a client can request for a service right like the first part where a client you know in, invokes yeah what we refer to as invocation we can have remote invocation method you are going to look at that yeah so this is like requesting for some kind of what uh maybe it could be a service or something if the server doesn't have it can invoke or actually talk to another server that has that particular resource yeah that's why you can say there's a server and there's a two there are two servers and actually client so we can have this kind of um, back and forth kind of sharing of messages between the client and uh, the server the other system architecture that we need to understand as far as distributed system is concerned is peer-to-peer -peer. I think we understand this kind of uh, arrangement where any kind of uh, object or any kind of process within a distributed system perform equal task yeah so we don't really have a dedicated computer yeah one computer can work as a, a server at the same time it can work as a client yeah so they perform in a peer manner yeah so we can't really have a situation whereby one is actually greater than that so i hope you understand this but it really uh, we really have this uh, specifically it's implemented in the uh, within the lower uh, network level like local area network so that it's connected to the major uh, client server uh, system so we are still going to look at uh, the various architectures i believe um, in our next discussion so this particular diagram shows how there's a back and forth so every peer co is, con is actually communicating to the other one there are other consequences or cons that brings uh, comes on board when you implement this kind of architecture like you can see there's no centralized way of managing the requests yeah from the client to the server right there's no control actually yeah so this one can cause a lot of delay and jam in as far as the process is communicating fine now without understanding of the system architecture now let's now break it down let's now understand why do we really need to have the essentials part of the distributed system right talking about the architecture yeah architecture we have seen comprises of different components of the what distributed system but for us to design this particular distributed system right in a right way so that you can isolate issues that comes on board right like the delay of sending and receiving maybe a given service yeah we have failure issues yeah we understand that distributed system actually work in a very uh we can say uh in a very complicated environment yeah we have a lot of things in a network environment there could be issue with cables or communication links yeah we could have server not responding so how then do we design an appropriate distributed system component so we need to understand the uh, various models so the motivation actually or the reason behind coming up with this system uh, these particular models is the difficulties and threats that a particular distributed system can be able to do or, uh, to encounter a given example uh, as you can see uh, there are kind of uh, many components that are subjected to various workload like talking about the internet as a distributed system yeah there are a lot of maybe additional websites or pages that are accessed or added day in day out so how do we handle that so we need to dissect that into a model right and this model is what we refer to as the architectural model yeah to understand the various architecture or better still the physical model yeah the fundamental building blocks of coming up with this kind of distributed system we also have a distributed system that works under different platforms what we refer to as heterogeneous yeah it could be different hardwares yeah so how do we pass and ensure that the different uh systems within a distributed system or component communicate effectively under this kind of env environment so that is what informs us need to have also the physical model we also have the internal pro uh, problems such as uh synchronization yeah of clocks we are aware that we don't have a global clock for this particular distributed system due to latency issues or maybe communication challenge issues yeah which could lead to some kind of failures so we need to design 
this distributed system to thwart this kind of problems so in such kind of manner we need some kind of um, like we need some kind of failure model yeah so that at least you understand should we have this issue how then can we ensure that the distributed system function as required and of course we have some external threats that could always face our distributed system it could be internal or external yeah but better still we need to have a security model that ensures that we have the right security mechanism for us to be able to avoid uh, this kind of distributed systems uh, problems of security all right so we have the different system models as i mentioned we have the physical model we have uh, the fundamental models we have the architectural model yeah borrowing from the architecture design that you have already looked at right so each and every model is there to ensure that we have the right design yeah so that in case of scalability issues in case of transparency issues we should be in a position to have a distributed system that doesn't really uh, fall uh, into this particular uh, problems yeah that's why we say systems that are intended for use in real world environments should be designed to function correctly yeah in the widest possible range of circumstances right so the first building block that we need to understand are the physical model now physical model are basically the hardware and the software yeah so this is the first model that actually uh, shows or tells the designer of how this particular distributed system is to work i talk about the arrangements of the communication links the hardware the networks and so on of course we're going to look at the interaction model that help us uh, understand how the various uh, parts of the distributed system uh, communicate so let's look at the physical model right so uh, before we look at that maybe architectural model I've, as uh, i've mentioned also helps ensure that the different components work in tandem and together so the compet the computational aspect yeah ensuring that maybe how one particular uh, design or system component should work effectively with the other one talking about different servers yeah passing uh, different uh, processes or resources between them and so on now the main part of this particular models uh, which we really need to understand are the basic components that we require to ensure that a particular distributed system functions are what we refer to as the fundamental models i think i've already mentioned them so we're going to look at the interaction model how the different uh, parts of the distributed system communicate yeah uh, also we have failure model right should we have issues with the link yeah maybe there's no reception of a particular process right or thread how do we handle that we also have security models that actually help us ensure that we protect any given distributed system against any external or internal interference so we are aware of all this is only that maybe we don't know how to uh, string them together so when you talk about the first model the physical model as, as i've said these are the uh, foundation or the building blocks yeah, of a particular distributed system so we talk about the underlying hardware elements right and this particular hardware elements as we know they manage or we have a lot of other physical components that are attached to these hardware elements yeah so the work here is to kind of bring or come up with an, some kind of abstraction layer so that other applications running on this particular hardware really don't uh, have difficulties understanding how the architecture of this physical model is uh, or the comprising uh, architecture of this physical model is built now as i mentioned these are the building blocks and that's why we call it the baseline the baseline physical model so the concept of designing a distributed system starts from understanding the required hardware and rather the software and how at a minimal level how the connection happens right so that's what informs the reason as to why maybe we need to design a particular a particular a distributed system now but we had challenges or we need to understand where are we coming from with respect to this physical model so we need to understand the generations yeah that 
the various uh, uh, distributed systems were designed as far as the physical model is concerned because you can't really talk about the physical model without mentioning how it has already or um, changed with the time right so we have the early distributed system under the generation of distributed systems these were implemented in the year between 1970s and 80s so at this point what informed the reason as to why we require the distributed system is actually the existence of local area network technology not even the internet if even if there were internet there were very minimal connection right so the internet kind of uh, network were implemented at some point we had the token ring technology being implemented right so they could only connect a few nodes like you can see it was between 10 to 100 yeah uh, file transfer was not right really that good yeah so we had a little sharing of resources within the early distributed system so we can say at this point the physical model was really not uh, uh really not effective uh, the other category or the other generation is the internet scale distributed systems which were informed by the emergence of what internet yeah so it was implemented or started in the year 1990s in response to the dramatic growth of the internet yeah so the capability or the features of the distributed systems were expanded based on the what uh it's um uh, due to the emergence of the internet so the, uh, the resource sharing was improved yeah you can see most organizations started a kind of attaching their systems to actually operate within the what the internet and that's why we talk about this generation of internet scale uh, distributed system the last generation because you're talking about three generation is the current generation the contemporary distributed system we talk about the mobile computing uh, distributed system that actually uh, facilitate this kind of a uh, physical model so we have the mobile devices that can help us move from one location to the other yeah without really it cause it brings uh, the openness characteristics of a uh, distributed system it also provides you re remember we talked about transparency location transparency right we also have ubiquitous computing the wireless technology that allows uh, the embedded of uh, different objects. I mean, talking about the washing machine, yeah, these are things uh, they are computerized in a manner to ensure that we can have this kind of what uh, distributed systems arrangement. We are aware or familiar with the computing or cloud computing where we have different versions. We have cluster computing, we have grid computing. All these enables us to maybe interact with the different services. We talk about platform as a service, so you really don't need to have physical a uh, platform. You also talk about software as a service, yeah, and name them. The, the different services that cloud computing uh, offers, that what is what we can actually talk about a contemporary distributed system. So we can see the far we have come from, uh, the, uh, the far we have come from, uh, kindly. Now, you either mute or I remove you from the meeting. It's simple. Yeah, we are all grown-ups, man. We don't interfere with our class. Perfect. So, those are the generations of uh, the distributed systems that we can actually uh, talk about as far as the physical uh, model is concerned. So, in a nutshell, you can say the kind of uh, features or rather the characteristics that were adopted uh, in the different uh, generations yeah so in the early uh, distributed systems actually this the, the scalability was really not that uh, large it was small and so on so those are whatever we have already uh, discussed so this is what informed the arrangement or how the architecture of these distributed systems were modeled under the physical model. So I think that is very, very clear when you talk about the physical model. Now, the other model, which is really very, very important, and you've already looked at it, this is how the various components or the blueprint of the distributed systems are linked or tied together. So 
it allows us to have the separated or the specified components and understand their uh, relationships. So it brings on board also for us to understand how communication happens between these different what uh, components. Uh, we have so far mentioned the various uh, interfaces, right? So how then do you design a particular distributed system? Uh, talking about architecture, yeah, it's like a house. Yeah, you, how do you design a house? Yeah, the good thing is that the distributed system or this model should give some room for future scalability addition of other components and the interfaces because if you add a component there must also be a given interfaces when i talk about interface i think you recall the service interface and the rest of the interfaces that we have uh, talked about right now the architecture model is boosted by the various elements yeah and we need to really ensure that we understand uh, these particular uh, elements right someone is asking for zoom link anyway uh, so we can understand the various building blocks of a distributed system under the architectural uh, model by answering these four fundamental questions right when we talk about communication we need to ask what are the entities that are communicating in this kind of distributed system right what kind of entities is it client talking to a client is it server talking to server and so on after we've understood the entities that are communicating in a, in a given distributed system we then ask the following question how do they communicate yeah so the first question we can pull out the commu uh, the communicating entities in a distributed system uh, the second question how do they communicate we pull out the communication paradigm in this particular uh, system so i think the first actually shows or and make us understand how communication happens the second two questions uh under maybe help us understand how group uh communication happens yeah what we refer to as indirect communications yeah so we we'll look at how the physical distributed infrastructures are mapped the real and responsibilities in of each and every object yeah we, talk, we are going to look at the client stub talking to the server stub and the remote method invocation and the remote procedural call yeah whereby we need to have the different roles and responsibilities so let's look at how we can answer these two or actually the questions so the first two questions help us or help, help us understand how or how to identify the various communicating uh, entities so we can solve these particular questions uh, by looking at My friend, that's the last one. All right, so we can have this question answered uh, based on the system-oriented approach or problem-oriented approach. Uh, we have two categories of communicating entities. Yeah, we have uh, the system-oriented entities and the problem-oriented entities. When we talk about the system-oriented entities, we look at how the various components communicate yeah by bringing the idea of processes right so if a server and a client for instance uh communicate there's some kind of processes that are initiated yeah and that's what informs the concept of inter-process communication so we can have different processes uh being initiated from the client yeah and the server needs to actually respond or actually uh get to understand those particular uh, processes so that is from the system oriented so processes is one of the things that helps these particular communicating entities achieve the objective the other part of the system oriented uh, option is to understand how the various nodes yeah are integrated and this is the concept uh, we need to understand also again how we can improve 
uh, the different processes because if we have many nodes connected in a given uh, distributed environment we also need to boost and understand how we can manage the various processes and speaking of managing or supplementing these uh, activities of the processes we are going to understand how to uh, how the various processes use the threads uh, to communicate so we are going to look at uh, interprocess communication in details i think it's in our next class and how the various threads within a process plays different roles all right from the programming perspective for those who are uh, good programmers uh, we need to understand how to program the various objects yeah so that they can communicate effectively uh, with one another as i mentioned we have the components yeah we can also have the interfaces yeah, that provides uh, these particular services such as the web services and so on so from the programming perspective we can provide a problem oriented approach so here the communication entities uh, could be objects and remember an object or a message an object is something that we really need to uh, for example secure we need to know how the various objects uh, interact and so on, yeah amongst or between the various uh, components right so we talk about the interaction and so on we are going to look at uh, the interaction model under the fundamental uh, models now after understanding the communicating entities then how do they communicate the concept of communication paradigms right so we have three categories of ways that this particular communicating entities uses they can use communicate via the processes yeah sharing of processes in what we refer to as interprocess communication they can invoke some kind of process remotely yeah uh, in what we can look at uh, as a remote procedural call or remote uh, remote you know, in invocation methods we can also have some kind of group communication which i refer to as indirect form of communication i think the first two bullets interprocess and remote happen indirectly yeah so you must have two nodes communicating right at the same time not really at the same time but they, they should be available but in direct communication the two nodes really they don't need to uh, be available or they don't need to have some kind of time frame for communication okay let's understand more about this so as, as i mentioned uh interprocess communication there must be some kind of message or process that is shared right uh they can be shared amongst the different applications or uh, objects for that matter or better still clients sending a message uh, to a particular server right remember the interfaces that can be provided by the application programming interface now when i talk about the api uh, it reminds me of maybe the assignment that i gave you last time to understand the various ip uh, i mean internet protocols and also the various um, uh, what to refer to as the ports yeah so if you did that assignment then you should be understand should be able to understand what sockets are yeah because these are the the interfaces that allows the two components within a distributed system uh, to communicate yeah you can imagine the socket at home the electricity socket yeah so when you you plug in uh, maybe some kind of uh, uh, interface yeah you can get you, you must have the appropriate plugin so that you use the right socket so if you don't have the right uh, protocol or port then we can't communicate in this kind of interprocess uh, communication so it happens a lot in the one uh, one to um, point to multipoint communication in what we refer to as a uh, multicast communication of course this multiple uh, multicast communication also uh, is going to inform us uh, to understand how group communication happens right uh, remote invocation as i mentioned we can have different ways of invoking the server or the uh, end uh, node yeah the, the receiving node so we can do that through different operations procedures yeah or method we are going to look at interprocess communication and look at all these invocation procedures in details uh, like when we talk about maybe some kind of request 
yeah when you request for a particular web page yeah there's some kind of communication between the client uh, pay uh, request and also the web server response yeah in what we refer to as the request uh, reply protocols yeah so again I'll kind of request you to understand the various protocols that we have and also the ports yeah also determine and understand the various secure uh, ports right and those ones that are not uh, secure of course we have the uh, remote procedural calls which is more or less the same as the remote method invocation yeah but in remote method invocation now we have objects yeah invoking some kind of uh, request right so we are going to look at them uh, in details but again understand that this is how the various entities communicate through remote invocation i think the last part is the indirect communication that happens between uh, the two entities right as i mentioned the the former options that you have looked at kind of gives direct communication in that there must or there should be some kind of uh, availability of the sending and the receiving what node yeah communicating together right so in contrast a number of techniques have emerged whereby the communication is indirect through a third entity allowing a strong degree of decoupling between uh, senders and receivers uh, uh, decoupling means there's no need of knowing whether a sender and receiver is there yeah so you decouple the engagement right so in particular senders do not need to know who they are sending to what to refer to as space and coupling and of course the time frame yeah senders and receiver do not need to, to know the existence of them so we normally say that we have the kind of uh, message queues yeah where a sender can just queue the message at the receiving uh, receiving uh, end yeah so they can always or the end or the recipient can always read those particular message at some given a time it could be even after some months or years so talking about indirect communication we have different techniques as i mentioned one of them is the group communication now a good example of group communication is a multicast form of communication or even broadcast communication I, I i believe you guys know this concept where a particular machine if they want to communicate with uh, other machines they don't care who will receive that particular machine but they need to have or become part of a particular network for this group communication to happen so that's the concept right so we can have a communication where different processes are actually communicating yeah haphazardly within a group so it doesn't they don't really it doesn't really matter who is going to get that particular uh, message but for you to join the group you must subscribe yeah so we can always have the concept of the different uh, of the different uh, processes joining yeah or subscribing to some formation or group communication so that they be part of that particular so uh, part of communication so actually here there's some kind of identification that is given to the processes right so that at least uh, some kind of uh, when the distribution or actually the sending of uh, this kind of messages can be uh, monitored or tracked as i mentioned we can have message queues yeah here is where maybe the sending uh, pro, uh, the sending computer for that matter uh, sends it to the uh, end computer yeah or the recipient and queues that particular uh, those particular messages yeah uh, a common term is the buffer yeah creating some kind of buffer so that at least the receiving computer can always get to read those particular messages at some given uh, time another concept is the, is the tuple spaces now tuple for those who are maybe uh, good in d uh, database development you understand that tuple refers to some kind of records yeah where you store some information right so tuple spaces here can refer to how this particular uh, communication how the structure uh, how they store these particular uh, messages which can be read yeah so if uh, once they have been read from the tuple spaces they can be deleted or removed then brought uh, the other new messages are brought into the tuple space and so on so it's kind of a pipe or a way to manage the various uh, messages all this is courtesy of indirect communication remember when I to, when you are talking about the shared memory i said that you're going to meet it again so 
In direct communication, uh, this is a concept where the different processes have the ability to actually uh, communicate or read or understand the different messages uh, on different uh, memory spaces, right? So uh, the distributed shared memory, as you have seen, uh, what we talked about, the tightly coupled away, right? So programmers have the ability to ensure that every com uh, computer or every process has some kind of memory and there is some kind of layer as you had seen yeah that ensures that different computers different processes can be able to read the memory addresses yeah without any given uh, challenges so the concept here or the major obstacle so that this kind of communication happens effectively is the ability of some kind of copy of messages to be replicated uh, within this kind of what arrangement so that each and every uh, process can be able to read the message in a synchron in, in a synchronized manner and providing some consistency otherwise it's going to create some kind of challenges that you're going to look at uh, just in a few so those are the kind of uh, communication uh, we had the communication paradigms how these particular entities communicate and of course we had the communicating entities uh, what is communicating right so we mentioned the various uh, entities we had the problem oriented option at uh, the system oriented option we have also looked at the interprocess communication through message passing multicast and so on up to the last option which we had in direct communication perfect so uh, to wrap up the idea of architecture model uh, we have the patterns patterns actually are there to supplement the elements that you have already looked at how the communication uh, happens right so when we talk about the patterns we can always categorize or what we refer to as um, actually separating uh, the various communication patterns yeah we can have communication in different layers right like I'll take you back to how OSI model is implemented yeah, within a network. OSI mod model operates under seven layers. So each and every layer kind of communicates with a different or a, uh, the layer above or below it. So the same, same concept. We can have archite architectural patterns having the different uh, layering uh, options. So here we have already looked at operating system so you can layer the communication that happens within the applications. Uh, we can have middleware. And of course, the concept of abstraction uh, comes in so that at least whatever is uh, operating within the upper layer doesn't really bother uh, to understand uh, what is up ha happening, uh, what is happening within uh, the lower uh, layer. So these are some of the, uh, sorry, these are some of the layers that complements uh, the kind of elements or architectural elements that you have already uh, looked at. Why do we need layers to actually facilitate uh, transparent communication to create some kind of uh, uh, fault tolerance way so that you can really isolate yeah, the layers that really are not actually operating. Now, to further understand this layering, we can again uh, sub categorize the various layers into what we refer, refer to as tires yeah or what we uh, commonly refer to as the tired architecture we understand the concept of one tire two tire three tire architecture in the networking field yeah where a client communicates with a server that is one uh, that is Okay, sorry, sorry for that. Let me connect again. I hope that is the first uh, time that this is bringing issues. So I believe we understand that concept of the tiring, in particular with respect to the network, yeah, where we have one tire, I mean, we have two tire, three tire, based on the kind of uh, communication that is happening between the client and the server, and of, of course, if you have some kind of storage facility, we can 
also have the third tier uh, contacting the database so that's what we refer to as the tiering yeah organizing some kind of functionality uh, into understandable uh, manner so the concept of two and three tiered as i mentioned we have the three approaches how the user interact with the applications yeah again i'll refer you to the uh, to the osi model how the presentation layer right so the various applications yeah can also inform uh, how we can actually pick or store data within the given uh, databases, right? So we have this concept that we need to understand when we talk about two, three tiered architecture. The first approach is to use or have the presentation logic allows the users to interact with the application. Yeah, the application logic provides an environment that uh, various applications can uh, run or communicate within an organization uh, we can talk about various applications yeah like the business application that comprises of finance uh, maybe applications HR applications where do we store this data so we have to, to we need to engage the other tire which is the third tire data logic yeah so it's concerned of, with how we store or actually interrogate data within uh, the database through the concept of data management uh, system. So there's a diagram here uh, showing how the two tire architecture is actually uh, implemented. You can see we have the client machines or so the client computer showing some kind of user uh, controls, user views. Yeah. So there's a, there's a direct communication between the client computers and the server computers. We can also have the client applications or the server applications actually responding so that's the two tier approach very familiar we have the third tier that is bring the data logic yeah the database into perspective yeah? like you are seated behind your machine using or requesting for a particular a web page yeah so that web page you interact with the web browser it it's uh, It brings the interface, uh, the form, yeah. You populate the form. You store the data within the database manager. So I think that is a three-tier uh, architecture that also we need to understand uh, when talking about uh, this kind of architectural uh, model. So try to understand the OSI layer model. I think it's going to play a major role when you are going to be talking about networking of uh, these various uh, distributed system. Now. The final model, and which is a very, very important um, model when it comes to designing uh, the essential uh, components of a distributed system, right? So here, it's like dissecting into the nitty gritties the main, uh, the main problem that can face this particular uh, distributed uh, system, as you have seen. So how do we then uh, have some kind of models or fundamentals as the name suggests so that we provide uh, the right design for the various categories or components that we have already uh, seen. So we are going to look at the various categories of fundamental me uh, models. As you can see, in general, a fundamental model should contain only the essential ingredients that we need to consider in order to understand and, re and reason about some aspects of systems. A behavior so it just of, of offers some very common and actually essential uh, components that we need to understand so talking about the fundamental models we have different categories uh, we have so far seen the interaction how the various components communicate between themselves so they interact we are going to look at interprocess communication which happens asynchronously and synchronously right so there are those interaction that happens amongst the different components synchronously and asynchronously we have failure and this is the model that allows us to design a particular distributed system so that it can handle uh, the various failures that we can realize uh, in what we refer to as fault tolerance mechanism we're going to look at some kind of failures that are likely to uh, be achieved uh, like we can have the channel issues where the 
actually communication happens and so on. And most importantly, the security model. Yeah, this ensures that we can actually um, design a particular uh, distributed system so that it doesn't really uh, have issues of security. Perfect. So when we talk about inter interaction model, so this is one of the one of the fundamental models that we have already looked at. So the key issues here, or the significant factors here, that affects this kind of model. Um, Uh, sorry for that once again so let me just share the screen again so as I mentioned one of the fundamental uh, models is the interaction model that we need to understand the two significant roles that is playing we need to look at the communication performance right when we have two components of a distributed system and how communication happens how is the performance because that is very very essential yeah. Uh, the other one is the aspect of delay yeah, or the ability of sending uh, what we refer to as latency because we don't have uh, a global clock. Yeah. So how do we maybe have or achieve this? Yeah. So it, it is impossible to maintain a single global notion of time. So then how do we deal with that kind of concept? So that is the interaction model. Right. So performance of communication channels yeah can be attributed to three factors relating to latency i've already mentioned that now we can have different approaches to latency yeah of course when you look at transmission of messages yeah it's the time yeah so people can say it's the time uh from where a particular sending process released the message to the time uh the recipient maybe read that particular message yeah or we can give other versions of latency mm -hmm. any other version that can describe what latency is i can get uh, we can have some feedback mm -hmm. some ways that you can also describe latency giving using an example very fast yes Guta. An example of a latency is where by when a person transmits a message over the network, it reaches a, a few, it reaches a, 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 an expected time rather than the expected one. Mm -hmm. So that is the network. Any other latency example? I know we have different <laughs> examples that we, we can give when we talk about latency. Anyway, with respect to the communicating entities, uh, this is very, very vital. Yeah? And we need to take note of this. Yeah? So the bandwidth also is something, uh, the, is another factor to be considered when designing a particular distributed system. Right? So, of course, uh, this is a network term, right? Uh, that maybe uh, ensures that you have the uh, enough uh, or the capability to, to transmit uh, some kind of information uh, at a given uh, time. We have jitters that is really uh, noted when transmitting some kind of multimedia uh, data. I've given an example here like uh, if consecutive samples of audio data are played with different time intervals uh, the sound will be badly uh, distorted so i think this is these are some of the, of the faces that uh, the problems that we are actually facing even right now yeah all this applies to what we are doing now yeah. uh, and i think the in one way hinders the right performance of communication within the distributed system so take note of that. Uh, we also have 
and I think maybe I'll request someone to read for us the computer clocks and timing events with respect to the performance. Mm -hmm. So any volunteer to read for us this under computer clocks and timing events. Mm-hmm. Kellen? Or who is that? Christine. Yeah, Christine, can go ahead. Each computer in a distributed system has its own internal clock, which can be used by local process to obtain the value of the current time. Therefore, Uh, is it may supply different times time values this is because computer clocks drift from perfect time and more importantly their drift rates differ from one another the term clock drift rates rate refers to the rate at which a computer clock deviates from a perfect reference clock all right, thanks. I don't know whether the challenge is for my side, but I could hardly hear you. I hope you're not experiencing the same for my side. So this is uh, just brought in this uh, kind of uh, uh, content here, just to illustrate the fact that we don't have one common global clock for the communicating entities. Because you can see the issues here, uh, distributed system have their own internal clock. And most importantly, for example, when a message is on transit, yeah, you, for example, when you're requesting some service from a server, yeah, it could happen that maybe there's some kind of delay or in network connection, yeah, and better still, uh, maybe the bandwidth uh, issue also could play the role. That's why we can't really say, uh, you can tell someone, someone can tell you, but I sent the message 20 minutes ago, yeah. But on your side, you'll say, I haven't seen the message. Yeah, so there could be issues. So there could be issues in between the communicating or uh, the communication channels, apart from uh, maybe the computers themselves. So those are some, some of the things that we need to put uh, into consideration. Uh, the other aspect is the variance uh, when it comes to. Uh, the interaction yeah uh, the interaction model right because we have seen that there are two processes or there are communication between two uh, nodes within a distributed system right so there are factors that you need to put into consideration how the message is being passed from the sending a process maybe to the receiving a process so this can happen in two ways right either synchronously or asynchronously as I'd already mentioned. Maybe the difference here, as uh, uh, when you're going to be looking at the inter-process communication, I'm going to uh, maybe describe this one in details. Here, we can tell or refer to the synchronous distributed as kind of communication that has some kind of time bound, they're time bound. So we can always have the lowest time uh, frame or the highest time frame or in between uh, some kind of timing. Whereas the asynchronous uh, really doesn't care, yeah. Even if it uh, gets to the recipient after some several uh, days or maybe months. In a nutshell, we talk about synchronous distributed system as using the known uh, the acknowledgement, what to refer to as trans a transmission control protocol. For the synchronous distributed system, they tend to use user datagram control protocol. So one acknowledges the recipient or uh, uh, actually has a way of managing the message that is being transmitted. The other one doesn't have that capability. So those are the two variants. And I think there's a quiz within the exercise. I've asked a particular question about uh, these variants. So I believe you can successfully answer that. Now, uh, the failure model is, I uh, think, also the other a model that allows us to understand how we can design uh, the various distributed systems so that they can be able to handle 
uh, this kind of failure so i'll really brush very fast so we have the omission failures yeah, om omission failures is part of the failure model talking about process omission failures so here is with respect to maybe if for example uh, the channel is overloaded or the system is not able to handle the given process then the process crashes yeah so we say this that is a process omission failure also we have communication omission failure where there are some part of messages that are really not uh, sent yeah to the uh, receiving uh, process or computer so chances are the receiving computer will not get the entire uh, message it could be due to communication link or just some kind of disorganization when the message is being uh, transported so take note of the the two omission failures uh, the other category are arbitrary failures uh, bitter failures are things that really don't have reason as to why they happen yeah for example a process may sent uh, sent uh, may set wrong values in its data items or it may retain a uh, return a wrong value in response uh, to an invocation so here uh, there's no really the values that are given is not actually the values that are received maybe because of distortion of the message corruption of the message or maybe hacking yeah uh, like when the message we have the mobile code yeah uh, we are going to look at the security model someone can tap into that and maybe change or alter how the message looks like so we don't deliver the real uh, message that is arbitrary failures so you can say the various uh, failures yeah omission crash arbitrary and failure and the description so some happens or affects the channel the communication channel but you can see majorly they affect uh, the process yeah so omission actually uh, happens within uh, the channel the last and the final model is the security model now talking about the very many fundamental models that you have looked at yeah we have looked at the interaction fundamental model uh, we have also looked at uh, we have also looked at the uh, which model is this we have also looked at the failure sorry uh, we are, and also the security model there are very many models sometimes it can confuse you so the security model allows us to as uh, as, uh, as it suggests uh, it can be achieved by securing the process and the channels yeah because we have seen from this particular failures we can have issues with the process and also the channel so it's very very important that we can be able to that we should be able to secure uh, these kind of uh, options now uh we can see a client there or the principal user uh, trying maybe to access some objects on a server this object could be maybe a database object or a, a confidential file for that matter right so it's you know there's some kind of invocation so how do we thwart or how do we reinforce security so we can provide the user with the right access rights so privileges yeah so that they can access just only the part of the object that they need to access so that's how we actually determine how to design the what to design uh, the security model of the uh, distributed system again you can see the the problem that we can we are likely to have when you have some kind of attack yeah so when a particular user or a processor are communicating via the communication channel we can have some hacker or someone uh, tapping and having a copy of the original message they can uh, what to refer to as um, they can change or alter that particular message then release it so that it is being sent as a different message altogether so i believe we understand the the security paradigm yeah uh, here we talk about integrity of the data being uh, compromised or the integrity of the message being uh, compromised so that is uh, some of the issues that you're likely uh, to get when actually using or having this particular uh, model so how did then uh, defeat these security uh, threats or challenges that we uh, get so we have the uh, concept of cryptography where we have the uh, encryption mechanism yeah, providing some keys right where the sender only the sender and the receiving uh, processes are the only ones who can be able to decrypt 
a particular a message so that's one way authentication happens in different levels yeah so based on the key it's only the person or the process that has the right uh, key or this the right in encryption key are the ones who are allowed to access that that's what we refer to as being authenticated and of course we have different ways of securing a channel a good example is where where we transmit data via the network are uh, using uh, virtual private networks or what we have referred to as the vpns so when we are building or designing these distributed systems uh, we need to put into consideration uh, this aspect of securing the various uh, channels so ladies and gentlemen i think we have brushed through uh, the concept of distributed system architectures and also understanding how these particular architectures are implemented using the various models so you should be in a position to identify uh, first uh, the various building blocks of these architectures i'm uh, talking about the distributed hardwares distributed system hardwares talking about the distributed uh, system softwares right those the middleware network operating system and so on. of course you're going to look at uh, the various softwares at some point again you need to be able to uh, identify the various challenges that how the various challenges can be addressed are uh, using the models that you have already mentioned so you can talk about the bigger model architectural model right uh, we have also looked at we have also looked at uh, the fundamental model and of course the fundamental model has a lot of other models uh, such as a security model and of course we looked at also the physical model that comprised of different um, what we refer to as the different generations so i think uh, i'll stop there unless if you have a question if